our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, today is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Before we begin today's Bible study, let's humble ourselves in the presence of God and dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Yes, we thank you for tomorrow. Yes, we thank you for eternity. Yes, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Yes, we are firm and secure in your kingdom. Glory. Yes, At the mention of your word, fears are dispelled. Mm. Life and hope returns. Yes, Even this day, King of Glory, at the reading of your word, mm. I know life has come. Mm. Hope has come. Mm. Peace has come. Yes, Resurrection has come. Yes, Lord. The kingdom of God has come. Yes, Lord. And for that, we give you the praise, Amen. the glory, mm. the honor, and the power. Yes, Hallelujah to you. So In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 So today's text will be taken from the book of Revelation. Chapter 21. From verse 5 to verse 8. As we build on from where we ended last week. Of John's revelation. When now the bride. Has come down. And God is dwelling in the midst of his people. And here John continues. And says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are truth and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give the of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all these things. And I will be his God. He shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Which is the second death. This is our word for today. Now, this passage begins with something very emphatic. It is Jesus declaring that I am making everything new. That is a very refreshing statement. There are statements that Jesus has made when you read the Bible that causes you to take a stop of whatever you are doing and reflect on the potency of those words. And it amazes you when you look at the wider scope of what is implied in that statement. When you look at statements like, I am the resurrection and the life, he, he, it's so potent. It tells you that death cannot have its hold over anything. And it is in the present continuous tense. So that means it is not in the future. 
It is in the present. He says, now I am the resurrection. Right where you are. It's, that means no dead thing can last forever in his presence. Because he brings to life that which is dead. So with him present, life comes out of anything, even the dead stuff of life. Look at where he says, I am the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. Again, he's speaking, he's talking about the present right now. To somebody who does not know where to go. To someone whose life is messed up completely. And you're thinking of how to make the best of the moment that you have right now. Which way should I take? He says, no, it's not which way you should take. He says, I am the way. In me, you will find that path. In me, you get that direction that you seek for. You say, I'm, I, you say, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Think through it. That means all roads lead to nowhere. If it comes to God, there is only one way. So all the other ways can only be authentic if they lead you to Jesus. But if they don't lead you to Jesus, you are on the path or the road or the highway to nowhere. The end will not be God. As Father, the end will be to God as a judge. So the end will not be to life. The end will be to death. Consider what he says in John 8:58. When he had that interesting dialogue with the Jews and says, before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, he's saying, I'm God. You're referring to Abraham. I was there before Abraham ever existed. I determined the cause of Abraham's life. I am the reason Abraham existed. I am the reason Abraham had faith. <laughs> I am the reason why you are now calling to Abraham as your reference of faith. He says in John 10, 30, he says, I and my father are one. Look at a statement like that. Jesus is saying, and another portion, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, I represent everything God represents. I am everything that you ever need from God. Isn't remember where he says, I will come again and receive you to myself. He's talking about a future that is uncertain to humanity. He says, I'm going into your future. <laughs> and I'm going to come back and receive you to myself. Without me, you don't have a future. So your future is only guaranteed in him. How is it having a relationship with somebody who has guarantee of what the future holds? So 
Look at where he says, truly, truly. I say unto you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. Not will have eternal life. Right now, believing in him makes you a candidate, a recipient of the life of God. And the word used there is the word Zoe, which means the God kind of life. The life that has no end. There's so many statements that we can look at that Jesus made in his earthly work that it will take you a lot of reflection to understand how powerful all the potency of what he's trying to say or the significance of that to your life. The truth is, even as we speak from the text today, he comes and says, I make all things new. <laughs> it's like not some things. Now, I happen to grow up in a family where I was not the firstborn. And that comes with its disadvantages. Because when you are right there in the middle, and the family is not so well off, so often they tend to pass down to you the things that are no longer fitting those that are above you. So what they do, they buy oversized things. So, and they get to put them on. And after they have worn them for some time, and they have now outgrown them, then they are passed on to you. So you get to put on the clothes that have been put on. And that means everything from the shirt to the shoes. But when for one moment you get something new, a new shirt or a new pair of shorts or a new pair of shoes. This you cherish. This is so dear to your heart. You find somewhere to put it every moment. But sooner than later it will leave you and then progress to those below you. The point is like we desire new things and it is not just the tangible things that we like about newness. You so see, we all like new things, new phone, new TV, new what. We are excited when something new comes in our lives. But even with the intangibles, there is a sense of excitement that comes with it. When you have a new job, when you have a new opportunity in life, it, it is a new horizon opening for you. There are new possibilities. There are new beginnings that are coming your way. And here Jesus comes with this statement to say, Behold, I make all things new. And he just doesn't make a statement to flatter. He confirms this by telling John right down. It's, it's not a statement of just saying I'm making things new. He tells John, I want you to write this. Write it down. Let it be on record that I bring all things to new. 
Yeah. He says, for the words that I speak are trustworthy, Andrew. They can be depended on. He puts a record so that it be proven with time. You see, it is one thing to say something. And if it doesn't come to pass, you are happy that it is not mentioned, people have forgotten. Often politicians make these promises during campaigns. And when they come back and people remind them, but you said this. They often get angry. Suddenly they change face. Suddenly they blame the people. But here God is saying, the Lord Jesus says, I want you to write it down. I make all things new. John, I want this written down because these words are faithful and true. And again, he goes on to address this and the fears that may come by making this bold declaration that I am the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, he's saying the reason this will come to pass is because from the beginning to the end, whatever comes in between comes from me. So whatever you are considering as new, it comes from him. So he is creating something that was not there. He's not repairing what is there. He says, I'm making things new. This is a wonderful God that we have. And I want you to note what he says here. He goes on to say, It is done. He is in the future, but speaking like it has already happened. Why? Because there is a sense of finality to this. It cannot be changed. This is how it will end up. It will be a wonderful story. And it says it is done. So he, he makes a lot of clarifications to what new things is going to bring forward. First he tells John, I want you to write this down. And then he tells him, this, my words are faithful and they're true. Why? Because I am the beginning and the end. And then he says, it is done. There is a finality that whatever he has done cannot be undone. Nothing can be taken back. You recall in John chapter 19 verse 30 that wonderful statement at the cross amongst the seven sayings on the cross the final one he says tetelestai it is finished in implying that the basis of our redemption was settled in full the sacrifice was ended now in John, in Revelation, he says it is done. Basically, he's saying redemption is complete. 
agamba ti o kuguli wa kwa fenobulu nzi kumaze kutuki the saints have returned home in glory in other words, whatever God has planned to do, not one is left unfinished. I want you to look at it this way. Right now, we are living at a time where the promises of God a halfway. Some have already been fulfilled. Some are yet to be fulfilled. But in the future, when we go home, we are going to live every day of our lives in a world in which every promise of God has been fulfilled. If now, when some have not yet been fulfilled, we get a, a glimpse of majesty and glory that often bewilders our senses. How will it be like when all the promises of God have been fulfilled and you are living in this moment when every promise God has made through all time has already come to pass. Think of that moment. That's what Jesus is declaring here. What kind of life can that be? See, yet there is a disclaimer here. Many of us are quick to disqualify ourselves. When such declarations are made in the Bible, many the, for many people you say, I don't qualify. God is not speaking to me, possibly speaking to somebody else. But look at what he says in verse 6, part B of it. Jesus gives both the qualification and the requirement. And then he adds a promise to it. A qualification the requirement for you to get there and then the promise. Look at what he says. He says to the thirsty, what is the qualification? Thirsty. So, to the thirsty, what is the qualification? Everyone qualifies. To everyone, then the requirement is thirsty. Then he makes the promise. I will give water without cost from the spring of water of life. Look here. The qualification is not worth. The qualification is not wisdom. He does not say you need to belong to a particular tribe. The qualification is not a nationality. The qualification is not the color of your skin. The qualification is not your fame. The qualification is not your status in life. It is not anything that can be found on your CV. The qualification is thirst. How thirsty are you? He's boldly declaring that I am able to satisfy that thirst. And this is not far-fetched. Back, I jot your memory back to John. In chapter 7, verse around 37 to 39. 
On this day there was a feast. And on the day of the feast, the Bible says, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Let's quote it properly. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. And John amplifies this and says, now this he said about the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Look at what is happening here. <laughs> the day of Pentecost has not come. Now we are on this side of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come and has made his way in our hearts when we believe in Jesus Christ. Look at what he says. He says, what you need to do is thirst. And that thirst should drive you to him. And when that thirst drives you to him, then he will satisfy that thirst. Now, the, thirst, the satisfaction of thirst is not like we think it in our minds. If you are thirsty now, you would love a glass of water. It ends with you. He says, He that believes in me, they are thirsty and then they come to him. He says, out of their innermost being is going to flow. Rivers of living water. Wonderful. Look at what's happening. What he gives you <laughs> does not end with you. It flows out of you like a river. That is what God calls satisfying. So, satisfaction in the eyes of God. It's not when everything ends with you. This is what was happening. I want you to understand concerning this feast. This was the Feast of Tabernacles. And Tabernacle was celebrating that journey from Egypt, the land of promise. Uh, when they dwelt in tents, and God came down and tabernacled with them. It was a seven-day feast. And for six days, the high priest would lead a congregation that would come from Jerusalem down to the Kindred Valley to the pool of Siloam, which is the pool called Saint. He would draw water from the golden pitcher and carry it up to the altar which was a rock and it. Now why did he do that? Because this was the great day. So every six days he would do it. On the seventh day he would not do anything like that. But why this? Because 1 Corinthians 10 foretells us 
And if we align it to what was happening, why was this action being done? Water being poured on the altar, which was the rock. Because they were put into remembrance. This rock that poured water for them for 40 years. And Paul tells us that they drank of the spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. So in the wilderness, God was teaching them the same truth he's teaching us today. That Jesus is the rock from which men can drink and satisfy the thirst of their hearts. Remember, he comes on the final day when the priests are not doing that routine and says, Behold everyone. If you are thirsty, I am the rock. Now you understand this. Let's expand this for a moment. He says, if anyone thirsts, he doesn't say thirst of what? He broadens the scope. So it doesn't matter what your thirst is. Is it a thirst for, to be significant? Is it a thirst of belonging? Is it a thirst that you are being overlooked in society? Or what is it? Whatever thirst... She says, come to me. Back to the text that we just read. You see, when we talk about thirst, it's an ending, it is a summon on its own. Because thirst is both physical, it is spiritual, it is tangible, it is intangible. There are so many things we thirst after. But Jesus says, I can satisfy. And when he says, I can satisfy, he's saying, I can provide to cause an overflow. Satisfaction in the vocabulary of God means there has to be an overflow. David understood that. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and says, and my cup runneth over. There is an overflow. It cannot end with you. And this is an indictment to our me generation. What God has provided for you, if it is by the Holy Spirit, it cannot end with you. It has to flow from you to the next generation. That's what he says in Deuteronomy 29 29. He says the secret things belong to God. But the revealed things are for us and our children's children. So I want you to take that mentality of you and understand that the father has a wider family. And you, out of your inner being, out of what God has blessed you with. He longs to reach out to another generation. When he comes to Abraham, he says, I'll bless you. 
I will make your name great. Wonderful. But he says through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So this blessing cannot end with Abraham. You and I are now recipients of the same blessing that flowed from what God said to Abraham. Hope that has sunk in quite well. Back to the text that we read. The story even gets better. Jesus says, those who are victorious will inherit all this. The new things that he has created, he says it is to be inherited. It is to be passed on. It is not for me. Jesus says it is going to inherit. All of it is going to be inherited by the victorious ones. So the qualification is for you to be victorious in Christ Jesus. And to prove to you that it will not be taken away. You see, there is inheriting something and it goes away from you. Because somebody else lays claim to it. We have seen all these battles. Somebody claims today they have an inheritance. They go to court and court decides, no, 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 the inheritance belongs to someone. But look at what Jesus says. He says, those who are victorious will inherit all this. Not some of it. All of this that I have created. And he says, I will be their God. And they will be my children. Hallelujah. He says, I, oh, the reason this will be your inheritance forever is because I am your God. And you are my child. So this is my inheritance that has been bequeathed to you. Now, <laughs> this, you see, all you need to do is be thirsty. And it is the thirst that causes you to become victorious. It is the thirst that causes you to overcome. It is the thirst that draws you to that place of inheritance. For you to overcome is to stand firm in Jesus to the very end. And this is what he says, all of this, all of this, that is showing John, all of this belongs to them. It belongs to the overcomers. This is what Peter tells us in his first letter to those of us who are waiting for this inheritance. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says that we are waiting for an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade kept in heaven for us. Kept in heaven for you. Jesus has guaranteed an inheritance in heaven. I don't want to use the word with your name on it, but I will say with your name on it. It is for you. That's the assurance we have. And he concludes all this by saying that it is to those of us who have been changed 
by the grace of God and will forever be his children. As long as you have come to Christ, God accepts you irrespective of your background. Now let's flip the side and see what happens on the other side. He lists three attitudes of the heart that yields five visible deeds. Three attitudes of the heart that give birth to five deeds. And he says the attitudes the cause of these attitudes that lead to these deeds you are going to miss out on this inheritance. This is what he says. The first category are the cowards. In other words, those who are fearful, those who are afraid to take on the yoke of Christ, those who are afraid of carrying the cross and following after him, those who fear to confess Christ. He says, if you fear to confess me before men, I'll I will not confess you before my father. Those who are not willing to be unpopular for this time. And they shrug off their shoulders at the offer of the life that Christ gives. That attitude will not will lead you not to inherit the kingdom. The second category he lists are those who are unbelieving. All the evidence has been placed before you. God came down as a child born in Bethlehem of Judah to the one that he created for 33 years he lived on this planet he was reviled he was rejected he was tormented he was crucified but he, all that was done to fulfill the scriptures to die in your place and purchase your redemption there is no more evidence heaven can give you let me speak to you who is saying prove to me there is no more proof. The proof is that God came down to save you. That is all the proof you need. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. He was seen by more than 500 people at the same time. And it is undeniable he is alive forevermore. Changing lives. And the people speaking to you right now were changed by grace. So there is no further proof you need. There is no further proof God will give you. He has given you the proof. There is no further evidence. When you refuse, you have rejected the truth before you. Now to the third group. These are what we call the vile. Now the word vile means something that has become foul. You see, it's like a fish left there. Over time it becomes foul. It gets a stench. We all don't begin that way. Our nature is that way. 
And if this nature is not changed by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we then tend to rot, we become vile. And we begin to feed our minds with filthy stuff, filthy literature, filthy words, filthy images, then filthy attitudes, which leads to filthy actions. Then what happens? Then murders come in. Then whatever, everything that is vile sets in motion. This is where fornication comes in. This is where adultery comes in. This is where the occult comes in. So everything that is not godly springs from that point. And Jesus says, these ones have their place. Their place is in the lake of fire. Remember we said that is the place where the devil has his destination. That is the place where the beast has his destination. That is the place where the prophet has his destination. So God is calling us to conviction away from compromise. He's calling us to a place where we understand what the future holds for us and embrace that future. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, then every day of your life, every hour, every minute, every second, you are moving to a new beginning. There is a new beginning. This is what the writer of Hebrews writes about. Chapter 6 and verse 5. He says, we have tested the powers of the age to come. Hallelujah. So it's not, we don't have it all together right now. What you have tested, what you have lived right now in the Holy Ghost is just a taste of what is to come. You are now living in the partial promises. Then when the fool has come, it will be glorious. It will be wonderful. The point is God is doing, making new beginnings. And Christ says, everything will be new. Let me address you that has never given your life to Jesus Christ. No matter your status in life, no matter your position and estate, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Why don't you surrender to him right now? Give your life to him. Ask him to come in your heart. Change it. Change you forever. Say, Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, here I am before you, a sinner in need of grace, a sinner in need of mercy, a sinner who needs to be redeemed. Lord, I come before you empty. I come before you helpless. I come before you without any plea. Guilty as I am. 
I look to you for redemption. Save me, Lord. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he came down to die on my behalf. And he died and rose from the dead. Lord Jesus, I receive you today as my Lord and the Savior of my life. Come live in me by your Holy Spirit. Guide me and help me to live for you for every, for whatever is left of my life on earth. So that at the day when all things become new, I will live and dwell with you, rejoicing with you, loving you, and worshiping you forever. Thank you for saving me. Fill me with your spirit. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've made that prayer, you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. For you, the believer in Christ Jesus, this is wonderful news. Jesus says, I make all things new. I don't know what it is in your life that is holding you, that is stagnating, that is becoming foul. But in the name of Jesus, I want you to believe what he says right now, that he declares that all things are new and the newness of life will come in your life not by might, not by power but by the spirit of the living God Father in Jesus' name I present your people before you those that are struggling in life. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You the God who makes all things new. Make them new on their behalf. Turn a fresh page over their life. Lord. Turn a fresh page over that one who is wallowing in debt. Turn a fresh page for that one who is wallowing in sin. Turn a fresh page, O oh God of glory. For that one who is drowning in the impossibilities of life. Lord of grace and mercy in the name of Jesus. I pray and I speak freedom. I uproot them from where they have been stuck. And I speak deliverance in the name of Jesus. Be set free now in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you. Energize them, Lord. Empower them to spread their wings and fly. I thank you for the word of testimony because you follow your word to perform it in the lives of your people. Be glorified and magnified, King of glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. There is that number on your screen, please. Please call. Tell us what God is doing in your life through our programs and we will celebrate with you and testify what God is doing. So from Dominion Church, we are saying we love you and God richly bless you. So till we meet again next Tuesday, we say shalom.